Uh, first, I should say on behalf of Merrill Elam and myself, I would thank you very much for Alan for inviting us here to the AA, especially on this uh, occasion, this very special occasion, our first time uh, here. I also want to thank all the friends and family of John Dennis uh, for allowing us this uh, opportunity. And lastly, but of course not least, I want to thank all of you for coming. I know that your time is quite valuable and I pre we sincerely appreciate um, uh, your presence uh, here. Uh, we enjoy very much showing our work and talking about our work to colleagues and to the public as well. I have to admit that um, this is quite a different lecture for me. And in fact, I have pieces of paper in front of me. Some of you here that I know may be surprised by that. I don't normally have notes. But this is, I, I, I think, uh, quite a, a special occasion. Um, and in the past, I've really only concentrated on uh, the work of, of our firm, Scoggin, Elam, and Bray. But I think that uh, this is much too um, big of an opportunity to just concentrate on that work. So if you will bear with me, I'd like to um, make a few comments on issues that I think uh, speak to some broader um, uh, concerns in architecture today. We live in a difficult era. Every architect must believe that he or she practices and lives in the most impossible circumstances. We can only be as good as our talents in the times in which we live. Some forces that frustrate contemporary American architects the dogs of commerce hip at our heels, denying us time for speculation and scholarship. The difficulties and complexities of a democratic and inclusive system seem unmanageable and ungovernable, yet never before have so many had such opportunity for self-realization. Ethics as a measured test of personal values and constant reappraiser of tradition go, for the most part, unsubstantiated by the collective. But maybe our greatest frustrations come from the attempt to define architecture achievement only by past standards and criteria. For us, the most meaningful moments in architecture seem to be those that best resist the, and celebrate the circumstances in which they are made. I am convinced after some years and many encounters that architects are, by training and inclination, structural thinkers. This places them in a unique position of constantly measuring, evaluating, and testing all around us. It should and does position us as intellectual leaders in our communities and culture. With insight comes responsibility. For an architect, I believe this responsibility is rooted within the realm of imagination. Tal Calvino in his six memos for the next millennium were struggling to decide between imagination as an instrument of knowledge or as an identification with the world's soul. He decided on yet another definition. Imagination as a repertory of what is potential, what is hypothetical, of what does not exist and has never existed and perhaps will never exist but might have existed. He writes that according to Giordano Bruno, the spiritus fantasticus is a world or a gulf, never saturable of forms and images. To draw on this gulf of potential multiplicity is indispensable to any form of knowledge. The imagination is a kind of electronic machine that takes account of all possible combinations and chooses the ones that one appropriates to a particular purpose or one simply or, or is simply the most interesting, pleasing, or amusing. Now, the following group of slides, and I have to warn you, I have many, many slides. You can relax. I will not make comments about a lot of these slides because they're just too many, but I think that you will begin to understand. The first group of slides represent the world that Merrill and I have seen over the last, and we've been looking very closely at over the last 15 or 20 years in architecture. It's the world that we seek to resist and celebrate in our work. So Catherine or whoever with that, if we could have the lights.
said I wouldn't comment much, but I have to say for those of you in the audience that know about these things, I did catch that fish that's on that uh, slide on the right. It's hard to tell, but it's about eight feet long. This is a um, slide of a slave quarters in uh, Mississippi on the left, of course, the Pantheon on the right. We have been here. Obviously, some of these slides are, are maybe uh, overly uh, provocative. However, in the world in which we live, this is very much a reality, that architects are constantly caught between the kinds of images, the kind of symbols on the right, and the reality of, of our world, especially in America on the left. I think I would like to come in on this slide on the on the left. Some of you may recognize that is an installation by DeMaria in the desert outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Walt and DeMaria installed these poles that are about 30 feet tall, about two and a half inches in diameter, 200 feet on center one kilometer in one direction, a mile in another direction. Now when you go to see this, uh, it's managed by the DIA Foundation, which you also may be familiar with. 
If you want to go to see this, especially when you live in Atlanta, it takes about three days to get there. When you finally get there, you arrive at some place out in the middle of the desert, a very small town. A young man in a pickup truck <coughs> takes you for about an hour drive, and you arrive at this cabin that is out in the middle of what an area that they call the uh, North Plain. You arrive in the middle of the afternoon, and there's absolutely nothing there. You know, you begin to wonder why in the world you had gone to all this trouble to make this trip. The poles are literally don't exist. You cannot see them in the middle of the day. Well, naturally what happens is, as you could expect, as the sun begins to set, these poles begin to turn on almost like neon. And it's by the time the sun is um, on the horizon and is bright orange, the poles literally dominate the landscape in this incredible expanse of absolutely nothing for as far as you can see. And when I say nothing, there is nothing out there but you in these poles in this small cabin. These poles dominate that natural setting. And you can't help but come away from that experience thinking about the responsibility that one has as an architect to design the man-made object into the natural environment and that the relationship between the two is a very, very fragile relationship. Marilyn and I have taken most of these slides, well, we have taken all of these slides ourselves, and we were talking about this slideshow that we have been showing this show for a number of years. We've taken these slides and collected, and we gradually change it over the years. I was commenting to her that it's almost impossible for us, for me anyway, to talk about our work without showing these slides. It puts, it puts the work, I think, within the context. It begins to frame all of our kind of um, desires in attempting to do an architecture of our own time. What I noticed, however, in looking at them the other day, going through them once again, is that in the last four or five years, the world has changed so much. Uh, even history is beginning to be rewritten, uh, a very recent history, that I think now will begin to change this slideshow uh, tremendously where it may not reflect kind of the toughness of the situation that we live in these days. It may not actually, uh, with all of this diversity, truly reflect the kind of diversity that we are dealing with, the kind of um, anxieties that the world uh, uh, deals with, and in fact the kinds of opportunities, and certainly does not uh, reflect some, some of the social, uh, economic, and cultural uh, complexities uh, and challenges that we're faced with architects is uh, analyzing and wrapping back into and transforming within our work. That, by the way, is Meryl, for those of you that can't see her here in the front row. And uh, Borromini's installation, I think it's in, uh, in Rome, Palazzo Spada in Rome. That is something called the Ave Maria Grotto in Columbiana, Alabama, on the right. Obviously, that's about scale.
guess you're wondering now, by now, when will this ever end? We look at a lot of things. The slide on the left, I think, is my favorite slide. Merrill took this one night at a truck stop in Tennessee. What I like about it is that it begins to show me how she sees things. And what she sees is she sees things in the background, the foreground, and the midground simultaneously. What I also like about it very much is that somehow there's an American spirit about this slide with the A1 sauce on the table, deer head stuck on plywood paneling, with shotguns and these big huge trucks, all this sort of embodied energy <coughs> churning out in the parking lot beyond. Now, many people much wiser than I have told me never to show these slides and then try to show our work. That there's no way to, to top these slides. For us, that's sort of the point. But I do would, would like to show you uh, some of our work. As Alan said, for many years we worked in a large architectural firm. We dedicated 20 years of our lives to trying to understand how to put buildings together, how to manage buildings, uh, the process of building, how to talk to clients, uh, how to get work, um, how to deal with uh, colleagues within the office, etc. Uh, it was a very uh, wonderful time for us, a very fruitful time, and a tremendous learning experience. We thought, however, that there was maybe something beyond that kind of, of uh, architecture generated through an organization. We felt like that we would like to at least try to develop in some way or begin to see if we could understand uh, an architecture of our own that was uh, more personal. One of the first projects that we, uh, commissions that we received um, upon starting our firm about eight years ago was to design a branch museum for the main, the primary museum in Atlanta. Uh, some of you may be familiar with, it was designed by Richard Meyer. It was to be housed in this sort of greenhouse structure, existing greenhouse structure that you see on the right, um, those elements that you see through the glass were part of an exhibit that uh, were installed uh, initially in the space, but uh, the client stopped at that point and didn't develop the exhibit. The space itself, which you see on the left, was about 20 feet wide and 140 feet long uh, by about 45 feet tall, facing south. Um, in Atlanta, Georgia, if you, most of you, if any of you know, any of you know where Atlanta is, I'm sure some of you do, it's very much in the south, southern part of the United States. It's a very hot uh, and humid climate. There's very intense sun uh, nine months out of the year. It's also a very nice sun nine months out of the year, uh, but it's very bright and it's very difficult to uh, of course, to design a museum with that kind of orientation, especially within these kind of dimensional constraints. We worked for, it, it, it almost seems kind of naive to say at this point, but we worked for a number of months trying to just figure out what in the world to do with this space. You know, how do you actually make, install a museum space within uh, that kind of uh, context that would have a presence of, his, of its own? What we began to do is to try to clarify the architecture in the diagram that you see to the right, which in our own uh, rather simple way begins to try to describe uh, traditional aspects of architecture, in other words, a promenade, some sort of, of um, a colonnade that receives you from the uh, promenade uh, to the front door, uh, through a facade, into some symbolic space around which the major part of the program is uh, organized. And what we began to do is to think about those sort of traditional elements and begin to then um, uh, reposition them within the space that was allotted to us. And you can see what happened on the left, the diagram on the left, where you still have all of those elements, they've just been displaced. We have a facade, a major entry point, you have um, a procession. The procession is now a rampway system inside the building, actually, and the symbolic space actually becomes the mass of the building itself. So, uh, as again, as kind of uh, uh, simple as it sounds, what we begin to do is to think of this as a building within a building. 
What was very interesting to us about this is, number one, we, we hadn't for years uh, done anything as fine as wood paneling. Most of our work had been in the area of uh, industrial buildings, corporate facilities. Uh, we had never done work, for instance, for developers. All of our work was um, uh, very inexpensive work uh, under very, very tight cost uh, controls and uh, uh, schedule controls. So this is a very, very different project for us. The sponsor of the project was a woods product uh, company, so they were very interested in the, in the building or the, the building in the building to be built out of wood. So this wood paneling for us was, uh, in effect, a new adventure. In fact, it turned out, I think it's uh, fair to say that it's probably the world's largest piece of furniture. There are 10,000 pieces of wood paneling uh, in this little small project. The project, as you move through it, is all about getting close to the detail of architecture, the sort of fine grain of the architecture. It's all about relating the individual pieces one to the other and the individual events one to the other as you move through it. Uh, it has to be about that. You can't get away from it. Uh, if you can imagine, the entire project is actually narrower than this, this room here. So you're really up against it at all times. It was a great uh, experience for us because it got us back into getting our hands on the detail and the making, of the actual making of architecture. As I go through the slideshow, I think you will see that our, our work varies tremendously from project to project. If we do exactly what I said that we attempt to do in the in introduction to this talk, uh, the work, um, I think that uh, it's, um, you could see why the work begins to uh, change from situation to situation. Um, if I, I think if our work has any strength at all, that that's, that's where it lies. It's, it, it's somehow um, a, a, a serious attempt to take a very close look, a very close reading at the, at the situation that we're given, the situation defined by the context, uh, the built context, the social context, the context of the client structure, uh, budgets and schedules, uh, etc. All of that wrapped together uh, forms the situation and out of that situation we like to try to make the architecture. So from something like the museum we go to a project that I'm, I will show you now which is a library in a very small uh, community uh, right outside Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta is uh, one of the transportation hubs of the United States. It has one of the largest airports in the world there. This little community is at almost the end of the runway at uh, Hartsville International Airport, which is only about six miles from the downtown of Atlanta. It's almost a rural setting. Uh, it's a very complex uh, context in, in, in trying to understand, to make an architecture out of. You know, you see situations like this. This is the city hall, which I think is as odd as anything that we could ever, ever dream up. Uh, the courthouse, uh, all of the sort of institutions of the place over years have um, uh, been transformed in these very strange ways. Uh, it is one of the very few places left in the Atlanta area. Again, if, if you're familiar with the history of the United States at all, you know that there was a small war, uh, civil war there a few years ago. And if you know any more about it, you know that Atlanta was completely destroyed um, by the, uh, well, we like to say the... Uh, the army of the northern aggression. They burned, completely uh, burned the uh, city and Jonesboro, Georgia, which this is, little library is in, was one of the few places that still was left standing. Sherman's headquarters was here. And uh, so there are only a few uh, houses and uh, buildings that uh, uh, predate the uh, Civil War in, in the Atlanta area and they're in this, uh, this little town. It's also important to know that uh, this is the home of Gone with the Wind, uh, Margaret Mitchell's Tara, fic uh, fictional Tara, 
was supposedly in this uh, county. So everything there has been somewhat tarorized, uh, pawn shops, uh, all the strip uh, development, et cetera. Uh, it's gone through a very interesting transition over the years where I don't know if it's familiar to you, but the all too familiar scene on the right to us of the sort of strip development where these kinds of areas go from the uh, uh, almost rural setting almost overnight. I mean, in five or six years, these places are completely transformed uh, by uh, developers moving in, uh, the land values rising, this kind of environment on the right literally becomes the city, it becomes the place. Well, how do you make a, a library, how do you make a public institution that has something to do about a place that looks like this, you know, that almost looks like nothing? Uh, how do you make something out of it? And especially how do you make something out of it when the client has come to you and asked you uh, specifically to, quote, make the first architecture for Clayton County. Not an easy task. They wanted a library in this community that would be friendly and inviting and open. One that people could remember and come back to and enjoy. Might also say they wanted one built for very inexpensive, let's see, it was $68 a square foot, which would be, what is it, 40 pounds? 40 pounds a square foot. Very inexpensive, very typical public uh, program in terms of budget and uh, space allocation. One of the, I think, true measures of any uh, architecture is, is how it's received by the users and the public, and in this case the user is the public. We like to say that uh, we're quite proud of the fact that uh, uh, each year the Daughters of the American Revolution have their yearly uh, picture taken here at the library, as well as the uh, Jonesboro High School class. So we've sort of cut across all of the social strata, uh, be it as it is, in uh, Jonesboro. I can brag on it a little bit because this is really Merrill's work. Uh, it's quite a beautiful space, a very light and airy space uh, inside, uh, formed primarily by these wooden trusses that are really kind of off-the-shelf uh, items. Again, very inexpensive items. Uh, a chandelier made out of a uh, communication satellite. The American audience is always interrupt, by the way, and you can, you're more than welcome to do that. I've never gone through this set of slides when someone hasn't yelled out what's the siding on this, on this uh, project. So you're more than welcome to interrupt me, believe me. Um, so I'll explain what the siding is. Merrill come, came uh, to the office one day with this box under her arm, and I said, what's that? And she says, it's a gray speckled box. And I said, well, what's a gray speckled box? And she said, well, it's the librarian gave it to me. It's what all librarians have. They have gray speckled boxes. That's where they store things. And I said, well, that's nice. And I said, why do you have it? And she says, well, we're going to paint the building to look like this gray speckled box. And I said, well, that's just great. <laughs> um, I want you to understand that that is something that I would never, ever think to do, nor would I propose to do it. Um, However, you can see where that uh, opinion ended up. We spent about three months trying to develop a way in which to paint this building to look like that box and still give the client the same sort of guarantee in terms of wear and dur durability, warranty, et cetera. Then I was elected to go tell the client that we were going to paint this building to look like that box, uh, which took a great deal of courage, believe me. I'll never forget. I will never forget driving home after the meeting. 
and just absolutely astonished at the fact that they never ask a question about it. They never doubted it for a minute. They thought it was just wonderful. <laughs> they thought it was about what the place was about. It had some sort of sense of belonging to the building. They never doubted it. And I, I'll never forget, I, every time I show this slideshow, I, I'm affected by the fact that, quite frankly, it was, a, it was a, a really moving moment for me in architecture because I began to realize at that time that the public is out there fantasizing about architecture in a way that we architects have difficulty doing. This is a, one of our largest projects, that we've, not that we've done many large projects uh, to date, but this is one of the largest that we have completed. We uh, renovated these uh, little rectangular buildings that you see on this master plan slide on the left um, that look like that initially on the right. Our project is this sort of funny shaped building to the left on the slide of the left. It was, or it started out to be actually um, a community center for this housing that was going to be uh, part of the School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, a very fine university uh, right outside uh, downtown uh, Atlanta. Uh, it eventually, in discussions with the client, turned into not only a community center, but it also turned into a conference center. And then, since it was part of the School of Theology, they thought it needed to be a chapel as well. So in effect, it was a hybrid bu building type uh, that, and I'm sorry these slides are, are kind of hard to see, but I, I think you don't have to see the detail of the plan to get the idea. The fact that this was a hybrid building, that it was something that was a community center, a conference center, and a chapel, was something that we took quite seriously in trying to make a building that somehow did uh, satisfy the needs of all those things. The interesting part about it was that the chapel itself was really the focal point of the project. Being in a school of theology, obviously, it was sort of literally the heart and soul of the project itself. However, it was also the smallest uh, programmatic uh, uh, element. It was only meant, well actually it was meant for uh, a prayer chapel for about four or five people or they wanted to be able to expand that to three or four hundred people in some magical way. Well the idea is all about placing the chapel out in the landscape and literally giving you the feeling that the, the remaining architecture is spun off of that chapel and in fact you can begin to see how the geometry of the building then begins to literally swirl around the chapel itself. It appears to be a circle in plan. It's actually not a circle. It's two circles that are tangent uh, to each other. And the only sort of vertical element in the plan is a cross that is the spire for the, the chapel itself. What happens is that you enter, I like this stick. You enter here on axis with what becomes the nave eventually to the chapel that actually takes you back outside and into the chapel itself. It's only about 16 feet in diameter. But as you come in, you're thrown off that axis so that you know that the building is not really just about that chapel. You come into an entryway and you go back into a community room here, just a, a large living room with an interstitial space that allows you to use it in various ways, and then three conference rooms and a small library. It's very simple. A uh, little program. Well, you know, when you take seriously this idea, these ideas of trying to uh, analyze a program and evolve the program, and evolve the, the sort of spirit of the architecture, uh, I think that it's fair to say that the architecture gets to be um, uh, somewhat um, uh, ambitious and some people say even aggressive. Um, but in fact, it, it seems to us that there's a, a, a rational foundation for the evolution of these forms, and both in plan and in three dimensions. It doesn't just happen in plan, it also happens in section. I must also say, since I said about the cost of the previous project, that this is not an inexpensive building. This is a lot more expensive building to build but it was a uh, memorial to the Abbott Turner, one of the great uh, 
benefactors of the university. What happens is that the building really becomes uh, all about the introduction of light uh, on the inside. It has this sort of darker uh, exterior. Then when you go inside, it's, it, uh, the way it's shaped in these sort of uh, glass uh, structure that's inserted into the plan of the building brings light into the uh, building in all sorts of, uh, uh, well, I guess you, I would like to say almost uh, spiritual ways. That's the main um, meeting room on the right. That's, that's kind of funny. A lot of people think that's the chapel. That we, the walls, I don't know if you noticed, the brick walls lean out and they're cobbled. They, they lean out, the columns, the structure's straight. We didn't realize that when we leaned them out and we put these uh, supports in that we would begin to form what really looks like a church with another cross at the uh, intersection of the forms. You get the idea of the chapel, how this is really not the front door. The front door, you come around the other side, and then there's this large door that opens up, and people can gather on this uh, deck and out on the lawn for larger services. What's happened now is they have a lot of weddings and things like that uh, that take place uh, in the building. In fact, I had my parents' 50th wedding anniversary in this building. And then this is the uh, inside of the chapel itself. And you can see the cross that uh, on the right side. This is a small project that um, we have done for Herman Miller. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Herman Miller, the furniture maker, American furniture maker. Um, a very interesting company, one that we have been working with for almost 15 years now on different projects. We've done a chair factory uh, uh, for them outside Atlanta. They came to us and they had this space, this rather odd shaped building. This is not something that we would think to do. A building spec office building uh, by a developer. In that building they wanted to put a showroom and they wanted it to be a new type of showroom, a showroom that when people entered they would have some sort of new, develop some new mindset about the possibilities of interior space and how uh, obviously how their furniture might uh, fit into those new possibilities. So you know the idea of this, the form of this thing, the plan uh, that may again seem geometrically somewhat odd is all about this desire on their part to create this kind of new interior space. You enter here, uh, it overlooks a fountain out in a courtyard, it seemed to be the logical place to enter. There's this kind of tightness to the uh, closeness at the entry point. It's literally, the architecture is made again to sort of seem almost as if it springs from that entry point. All those spaces are really quite small spaces, but the idea of, of slightly distorting them was uh, to expand the, uh, the perception of those spaces to a much broader, uh, larger spaces than they actually are. And then as you move back through the plan, you go from this sort of entry zone into uh, what we call the gallery zone, which is really where they present their, their products in rather pristine setting and then into a zone that is a more typical uh, installation of their, uh, of their product. So the architecture starts out being quite, uh, again, quite, well, I, I hate to keep using the word aggressive. Quite frankly, this, this uh, um, space is really quite inviting and warm and soft. My mother thinks so, so <laughs> if she does, I promise you it is. Uh, the slides show it to be a little bit, uh, I think, uh, harder than it actually is. 
I think the detailing on the project and the whole idea of the attention to uh, materials and how things are put together has something to do with over the uh, time our understanding, the beginning to understand uh, Herman Miller's uh, attitude towards the making of things themselves. In other words, we'd like to think that we're beginning to make our architecture out of the things and in the way that they make their uh, furniture. It also, I think, reflects an attitude of this corporation in terms of attention to detail uh, and quality and everything that they do, not just the architecture, but the way in which they're quite well known for their management system and the corporation and whatnot. It's all about a uh, very uh, involved uh, team effort and attention to uh, uh, every uh, little detail of, of everything that they do. In this project, as we had, over the last few years, what has happened with us is we really got quite intrigued and, and, and involved with uh, by the construction process, the hands-on construction process, and involved with the contractors on our work. Um, it, I, I, I know here that you, well, my perception is that in terms of the quality of construction uh, here in Europe, that it's, it's maybe a little bit higher quality than we normally get uh, in the U.S. Um, our work, again, this is not an expensive project. It's a very, in fact, very inexpensive uh, uh, work. But what we've been very interested in is working with the craftspeople uh, that don't normally have the opportunity to do this kind of work. But what we found is that they really get excited about it. They really enjoy it. And they enjoy inventing the architecture with us. And I, I can tell you that we're not smart enough to detail a lot of this stuff. They have to help us. Uh, and trying to uh, make it happen and make it happen within the budgets. And they have a good time at it. I always like to use the example of this column, which is obviously not really a structural column, but they had built this, uh, the contractor had built this wing, this uh, kind of canopy that goes for uh, almost 200 feet. It's curved and sloped and goes all the way back in the building. It's really an amazing construction had built this thing and I came out and he had not put in this column and I said, you know, that little dot on the plan was supposed to be a column. Well, by that time, you know, every time I go out to the site, the contractors would all kind of gather around and giggle. You know, here comes the guy with the long hair uh, and funny looking guy and he's going to tell us to do something strange and different. Well, they all gathered around and I said, well, just forget it. You know, don't worry about putting the column in. But they went ahead and put it, and he said, no, we'll do it, we'll do it. And I, he said, where do you want it? And I said, well, about right here. And it should lean a little bit. And they said, ah, he wants it to lean. Um, so I go away, and I come back the next day, and he says, I, you got to come see the column. And of course, here they all come again. Uh, and, I, and I went over to look at it, and of course, he turns to me, and he says, you know, that column wanted to lean a lot more than you wanted it to lean. Uh, plus, it wanted some other things added to it. I think he thought we would take them off, but we didn't. This is a um, another library that is in a different part of town. This is the exact opposite side of town than the previous library. This is, um, uh, do you have yuppies in London? Oh, okay. This is the home of the first yuppie. This is Buckhead, Georgia. Um, a place that uh, looks a little bit like this, that once was a very definitive neighborhood with churches and uh, public facilities that were used by the people that live there. We now have things like this on the right that are coming in from somewhere. Uh, we have uh, these sorts of uh, objects that present a rather strange and perplexing, again, environment. However, this is probably uh, the wealthiest part of the city of Atlanta. And right off only a couple of blocks from this kind of environment, well, literally a block, are cluster mansions. Uh, that had been built on land from real mansions that do the oddest and strangest of things. I mean, I could show you slide after slide after slide of hundreds of these 
million dollar homes uh, within our city that are the most bizarre and strange and weird architecture that one could ever imagine, of course, all couched in traditional uh, settings. Where a, a neighborhood where literally the, the uh, founders of the, of the place, the people that, and many people that still live there, live in uh, houses like this, that is only two blocks away now from this kind of uh, uh, new housing, where it's in a tremendous state of transition. Again, a very difficult place to sort of figure out what to do, how do you respond to these dynamics of this context. Our site set on top of a hill, we have an overview of Atlanta that you, that you rarely see from anywhere, public sees anywhere uh, within uh, the city. It's a, a very dramatic uh, view of the downtown. It was taken several years ago, but you do get an idea of the, we do have a, a central city of sorts anyway uh, in Atlanta. I think it's fairly easy to see that the idea of the project was to take advantage of this view to create a rectilinear building that fronted in a very traditional way one street to the north, another street to the south. It changed from a very uh, pedestrian uh, environment uh, on the north to an automobile scale environment uh, to the south. So the architecture, uh, again, I like to think is uh, utilized as very traditional uh, means and traditional methods, traditional pieces of architecture where we create, in effect, a facade that addresses in a formal way the geometry of uh, Buckhead Avenue, a part of the share, a very formal entry point. However, this entry point has to be at three spots, one here, one here, and one here, to incorporate the uh, access from two parking uh, lots on each side of the building. The, the lot is completely paved uh, completely takes up the, the uh, with parking and building program. And there's this axis along which all of these sequence of events uh, are organized where you have this formal front door, an arrival point, axis that takes you to this view to downtown, and then it, again just a large room into which the collection is, is, uh, is set. And on the right you can see the plan with the furniture in it. What uh, happens in plan also happens in section, where the building, the lot, the lot begins to slope to the north, I mean to the south. The building actually extends up to, uh, uh, as it drops off, so that the scale of the building literally changes from the Buckhead Avenue uh, side to uh, Far Road side. There's a bunch of little small stuff here, bigger stuff down here. Even though this is in the uh, uh, most affluent section of the city, it's still a very tough setting. What's interesting about the building, it's a library during the day and it's a nightclub at night. Uh, out in front of it, is a, a, every night there's this huge block party. Uh, it's surrounded by what we call beer joints, uh, nightclubs. The, this whole neighborhood at, at night is uh, sort of the entertainment center of the, of the city uh, for young people and they just have a great time. But every morning the building, all of the seats and things around the building are just covered with uh, beer bottles. Uh, and it's actually quite festive and quite uh, positive. It's very uh, nice. Uh, and fun to go watch. I guess I should have said this building, um, since it is in a little bit wealthier uh, neighborhood, they uh, demanded that the building have um, a more traditional uh, siding on it, so we put slate on the side. It's just applied that in the normal way that you would you would put slate on the roof. We put it on the side of the building. And that's the where well, you saw the view of the downtown. I'm going to show just quickly a few little projects that we're working on now, just to give you an idea 
not only of the context, more context that we work within, but the kinds of projects that we're taking uh, to do. This is a house that's on this little lake. Uh, it's a, just a, a weekend house for um, a doctor and his wife. It just has a, it's only about a thousand square feet. Um, it's like one of these toys that you change, kids change in, into different uh, uh, to animals or whatnot, where these big panels, glass panels slide through it, change the nature of the rooms and also change the uh, exterior form of the house. This next house is quite different. It's for a family that has six kids and the whole house is all about the kind of uh, family politics uh, within this uh, a very, very interesting family. Uh, you'll get an idea of the scale of it. This is a, a riding rink, a tennis court, a polo field, swimming pool, uh, the main body of the house, the kids' wings, uh, and the uh, adults' uh, bedroom. It's like an eight-car parking garage. Uh, this place is almost like a factory. They have like three uh, dryers and four washers, two or three refrigerators. It, it's just amazing. Uh, the mother sits perched here in her office. That's the kids' toy room, the family room. She's sort of at the centroid of all this activity where she can, can look out and see all this stuff happening. They have some very interesting ideas about how they're raising their kids. And so each, each kid has an, um, his own uh, bedroom, his own shape, his own has worked with us to develop his own program for his own space. Um, <laughs> So when, again, when you begin to do an architecture that's all about these kinds of complexities, uh, you get some fairly complex architecture. It's sort of all hell breaks loose on the back side where <laughs> the, the kids' rooms are, but they just have a great time with it. They were, in fact, they were in our office yesterday uh, wondering when they were going to get started on their house. Uh, the last uh, project that we're working on right now, this is a library for the Arizona State University uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, where it looks like this, where things are impossible to you know, protect from the sun, 110 or 20 degree uh, sunlight, uh, produces a, a very interesting architecture, as Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin outside of Phoenix, where the architecture and the uh, natural setting almost become one. Our little project is here. We're adding to this rather odd-shaped building. This is our project uh, uh, here. This is under construction now. I had to put this in. Merrill is designing rocking chairs out of rocks that uh, if you've ever been to this area it's nothing but a bunch of rocks everything is just rocks so uh, we're actually building a uh, uh, well what the client is calling magic mountain which is outside of the of the building itself is our sort of landscape uh, feature you wouldn't think that these attorneys would uh, like these sorts of things but they fantasize about I guess it's, uh, this magic mountain being in their, within their realm. Uh, two more projects I'll go through very quickly. This is a, um, another uh, library that uh, Merrill has been working on. It's just been completed. The same client, the one with the funny stuff on the outside of the building, this is the same client. Again, a very uh, difficult setting, but somewhat different setting than the other one. The other one was a headquarters building. This is a, a library about a very specific community, as, as, as communities go in, this, in our area of the world. But it, does, it did speak to a very specific uh, population of, of a particular community. Uh, we had the idea to try to engage the children of the community, uh, community more with the architecture, uh, to get them uh, literally involved with the architecture itself. Uh, one of the most moving things I've seen, actually, on a construction site in many years, where we had these kids come to the to the building and, and put their put their uh, handprint in the building itself. So the building's covered by all these little, well, 
sometimes you can tell it's handprints. It's mainly just sort of globs as they begin to grab at the, at the stucco finish. But it was really a great experience for the kids. And four and five year olds were talking about uh, bringing, uh, bringing their children to, these, uh, to this building later. I, I can't imagine as a five year old thinking about having children, but they, they talked about that. Uh, but it's really quite nice a way to make this uh, building part of an inter literally an integral part of the, the life of these uh, uh, of the kids there in the neighborhood. It's very again a very difficult setting, more tara um, tara rising going on. Uh, the building sits between these funny uh, objects, uh, storage sheds, uh, a cow pasture, a uh, very strange uh, residential uh, area where. You know, you wonder what in the world could be going on there. Uh, men and women, by the way. That's the existing library. Um, I, I, I like to talk about this little project. It's almost like a mushroom out in the forest. You know, that it's this sort of strange uh, object that has some sort of internal uh, energy to it that sits out and somehow holds its own amongst all this uh, very strange and, and diverse um, uh, urban, uh, well, suburban setting. The color, by the way, comes from red Georgia clay. This is the color of the dirt we, in uh, Georgia. It's literally that red. This is, this is really an inexpensive building. This was uh, you know, about 10,000 square feet. I think for about, uh, let's see, it would be about $35, 35 pounds uh, square foot. Again, utilizing off the shelf um, uh, products um, that, you know, that you just sort of install them in, in different ways. I had a contractor who was installing these lights one day. I was out there and looking, he said, does this look like you wanted it to? And I said, well, I don't know. Is it like the drawing? And he said, well, it's sort of like the drawing. And I said, well, that's fine. And this other, his supervisor came up to me. He says, you know, you guys have got to stop this. I tried to get this guy to do something else yesterday. And he turned to me and said, don't bother me. I'm doing art. <laughs> See the building? That's the building in a cake. Cake form. That was at the opening. This is the children's reading area, this kind of egg shaped thing. It's very interesting on the, on the other library that I showed you. The public reaction at first is almost a kind of a shock. But what happens is, or, and what has happened with this project as well, it's created a lot of discussion, uh, I guess you could say controversy within the community. But what has gradually happened is that the, uh, it, it, number one, it's quite uh, um, wonderful to get this kind of dialogue going about architecture. Uh, but what we've been lucky, I guess, uh, in the end that uh, the public generally has come around and has uh, truly appreciated uh, these rather energetic uh, little buildings. And that's to the credit of the client. This is a very special client. Uh, we don't, obviously, you can't do this kind of work without a mandate from the client. Last project. This is a house. We had never done a residence up until a couple of years ago. This is a house that uh, is, this is about only about a mile and a half from downtown Atlanta. Believe it or not, there's this kind of wooded forest. In fact, it's a virgin forest that backs up to a science center uh, near the city. This is the Schmars. That's their, their names. Uh, Todd and Linda Schmar. A very interesting couple. They're both attorneys. That's not the interesting part of them. Uh, well, actually, I guess that's part of the interesting part. They're two uh, attorneys, young attorneys, that uh, have 
dedicated their, their whole lives, uh, it, well, I shouldn't say dedicated their whole lives, but they structured their whole lives uh, day to day uh, around their beliefs in a, a Japanese uh, sort of new religion. Um, and part of that their beliefs in this new religion has to do with the relationship of man and the built object to uh, nature. I can still remember Linda saying to me how she hated the house that she lived in because it was so embedded and sort of stabbed into the dirt, into the landscape. And she felt like that she wanted a house, uh, a new house, that somehow sat in within the landscape that had a different kind of relationship to the ground plane that somehow provoked one's thoughts, one's ideas about, um, about that relationship. The basic idea uh, was to, well, as you saw in the first slide, there was a tree that was on the ground. They, that's where they wanted to put the house. It was sort of on the top of this hill. What happens when you build a house where a tree is falling? You get a long, narrow house. Uh, but it was kind of an interesting idea because what it allowed us to do is to not remove many of the, of the trees on the lot. Also, um, this idea that um, Todd and Linda challenged us with, this relationship to the ground plane, developed into a scheme that uh, literally put the house on the ground without changing the ground plane at all, without changing the topographical feature at all. We did absolutely no grading for this house. Uh, the way we uh, did it was that we built this series of walls, concrete walls that run perpendicular to the lay of the land. In other words, all of the drainage, uh, the natural flow of the land itself literally is running uh, through the house or under, under the house. It's set up off of the ground. What's interesting about what happens is that the house, as you can imagine, the viewing at one angle appears to literally float above the ground and then from another perspective seems as almost as if it uh, is anchored to the ground by these walls. The plan is, is really pretty straightforward. The only difference is that it's all about this procession that they go through when they enter the house. Again, some, somewhat of, a, of an oriental tradition where you come into, uh, uh, through the, the, the wall of the house. It's really not the front door, but the front door begins here where you, take your, you sit and you take your shoes off you begin on kind of a procession down this uh, corridor way that is pointed towards a stair that goes up to their uh, Gashinden room, which is uh, where they uh, have a, a shrine for this uh, um, uh, Marikari uh, religion. But you really don't enter there as either, you, because you can't really get to that stair. And you'll see what I mean in a minute in the slides. What happens is you turn here, and that's really the entry point of the house itself, and then to the right is the dining and kitchen living room with a stair going up to bedrooms, and then this is their master bedroom, and then this is what we call the precariously placed in-law suite, and that's another whole story. That's looking back towards the uh, in-law suite a stair that goes up, you can actually access it from the outside without going through the house itself. You get an idea of what I mean by the walls where the, the house really begins to at one moment float uh, across the, uh, on top of, um, of the land itself and then from other perspectives it really looks as if it's connected in very deliberate ways with these walls. The, wall, the fenestration, the windows are, are, are merely a, a reflection of what's happening behind them. In other words, this is a, a stair, the living room here, uh, bathrooms and bedrooms and the small uh, penetration. I, I actually don't like the slide on the right because that's not what this house and deck is all about from the outside. It's actually, I'll show you in a minute, it's actually about an interior experience. But I'm so amazed by the construction of this, of this house. I can tell you right now, we could never draw something in detail as, as nicely as these guys have, have built this house. You know, we would do some sketches and we'd come out there and they'd say, well, what do you think about this? And I'd say, I think that's pretty damn great really got involved with it and it's a beautifully built uh, uh, construction. 
the framing to the all the finishes. These carpenters, you know, elder gentlemen, had their own sort of, you know, gear. They would made their own tool boxes and tool belts and things, and they smoked pipes all day and <coughs> sat around and talked about how they would uh, make things. You'd be amazed at how many uh, seemingly intelligent people called me and asked me how we shaved these trees. Uh, <laughs> we did not shave the trees. Those were poles, uh, well, telephone poles. I don't know if you have telephone poles like that here. Again, they're part of this whole idea of this questioning about the relationship of what's real and what's not, uh, what's natural, you know, the, uh, what's man-made. Um, what was kind of funny about it is this is the one item that the contractors kind of balked at. They were very nervous about trying to install these poles because they were kind of leaning and they were wanting to get them just right. And they waited and waited and waited and finally went to the clients. The only thing that they did that was questionable and said to the client, are you really sure you want these poles? But of course the client came to us and they said, are you really sure you want these poles? Uh, do we really need these poles? And I said, well, you know, I don't think you need them. Uh, you know, I don't think if I think if you don't do them, no one will ever know the difference. But if you do them, no one will ever forget. So of course they couldn't stand it. They had to do the uh, <laughs> they had to do the poles. This is uh, kind of the entry sequence uh, in. You can see where you change the shoes down the corridor, looking up to the stair that goes to the Gashinden room, and you get a kind of an idea. You would have to turn to the right. When you turn to the right, there's this uh, sort of rift in the, in the structure that uh, well, there's this little bridge that goes over to a door. Uh, we call it the holy door, and you'll see in a minute why. It's where they bring in their altar. I have to admit, I, I, I probably never should do this, but since this is in an architecture school, uh, this, this furniture we borrowed from Herman Miller showroom. I don't know if you noticed in the sides of the showroom, all these Eames chairs and things were in that showroom. They, this uh, client did not want to, uh, us to uh, design the house around their existing furniture, and they didn't have the money to buy new furniture. So we designed it uh, so just sort of with this concept of furnishing in place. And in fact, they have gone back now, and they've taken out this fireplace. They just absolutely hated it because it was the only thing in the house that was an off-the-shelf product and was not um, made by, by hand. This is the Goshenden room on the right. That's Linda and, uh, oh gosh, huh? Ian. Uh, Ian was born right, after, right before the house opened. It was actually supposed to be born after, uh, but that didn't work out. And, uh, <laughs> Ian loves the place, and he runs around. They have, obviously, they have to have a few gates here and there. But, but this is the Goshenden room. Every Monday evening, this house is open to the public, uh, and they have they give and receive light. This is the real um, shot. Of what I think is the experience of the balcony, where it really just sort of thrust out into into nature, and you you literally can't help but think about that when you go there and every time we've been there and there have been visitors there, that's the first place they go and, and they, the conversation is about thrust, literally thrusting out into nature. This is their bedroom, uh, master bedroom. That's the ancestor altar which is at a lower platform than the main altar space. This is uh, the door that they bring the altar through. It's only used once. Well, I see that I've used all my time, so I think I will stop at that point. And thank you once again for the invitation. Thank you very much. Five minutes for questions, if there are any from the audience. Don't be timid. In the last house, there are no curtains at all. 
Actually, um, that was by their, their desire. It literally sits out in the woods. You, you can't see the house um, during the, uh, well, nine months of the year. Uh, in the wintertime, when the leaves are off the trees, you can barely see the house back in the woods, but the neighbors are quite a distance away. But what happened was that uh, uh, the house has attracted um, architects. And unfortunately, Linda had to go back and split blinds on the uh, bathroom and bedroom, their bedroom and uh, bathroom. She felt like that every time she wanted to take a bath, she looked out the window and there was somebody taking a picture of the, uh, of the house. It's very easy to access. So, uh, but that was their desire. They did not want any, um, they wanted to be out there with nature. Any others? That all looks so natural to you that didn't know questions. Well, Good, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>